In all the time I've spent watching shoujo anime, reading romance manga, there's only been a handful of titles that actually tackle young love like it's, well, young love. Kanojo x Kanojo humors the question of polygamy while fully aware of the negatives. Say I Love You tackles how polar opposites are good for each other, yet also problematic in their own ways. However, 15 years later now, the one series I believe is one of the best romance series around young love is, and continues to be, Toradora. about a young neat freak boy named Ryuji Takasu who attends school, shunned and now cast due to the face he was born with. Upon an accident, he bumps into Taiga Aesaka, a short stack klutz who don't take shit from anyone and clocks him in the face. Upon a screw up with a confession, Takasu and Aesaka both find out that they're crushing on each other's best friends, Minoru Kushieda and Yusaku Kitamura, and both decide to work together and end up with their crushes. Personally? Toradora is to romance anime as Cowboy Bebop is to original anime. It's pretty damn good, and there's a reason why it's considered a classic. From its characters, to its story routes, to its conflicts, to its tension, to the focus on the good, bad, and ugly reality of romance, relationships, and unrequited feelings. From its music, to its art and animation, to its expressiveness and raw emotion that's bled into moment after moment with its acting in Japanese and especially English casting. Toradora is, at least what I believe, to be the closest you can get to a story around a group of teens all smart and stupid in all the right ways. I know nowadays when people talk about great romance stories, they'll probably want to point to Kaguya-sama or My Dress Up Darling or Nagatoro or Yufukashi no Uta, and while those are good romance stories, all of them fall under one category for the majority of the stories they tell, and that's will they won't they. Now there's factors that differentiate one another in certain ways, but ultimately that is what it is. Toradora is also this to a degree, but as a whole, it's more than that. It feels like it ultimately started as something along those lines, and left the rom-com aspect of it behind to become more like a romance drama, focusing more on the characters themselves, rather than just who they'll end up with. Again, you can defend this by saying Dress Up Darling does this as well, and that is true. It actually has a lot to do with one's passion and being accepted by others. But Toradora focuses more on how those you love, be it familial, platonical, or romantical, shape who you are, for better or worse. Without any of the main or even the side characters, the show falls apart. But in order for me to prove that, I'm going to have to start from beginning to end. And yeah, I'm going to have to go into spoilers eventually, so if it looks like a show you're interested in, that's your only warning, so... The show would first start it off, like, as I said, as a romantic comedy. Many characters you can tell feel like the world they live in isn't as serious as they may think it to be. Hell, there was this whole misunderstanding at first about how both Aisaka and Takasu being a couple, and with that knowledge, it went as bad as well as you expect. But as time went on, what seemed to be quirky, humorous characters came more into being fleshed out adolescent teens with different worldviews and different ignorances. First off, Let's talk about the two main leads, Aisaka and Takasu. Both of them kind of come from the same cloth, that being isolation. I've covered characters like these before, but similar to the other examples, again, it was mainly just a will they won't they. Here, it's not just used to give them more depth, it's not just used to have them be drawn closer together, but it's used as a way to show how they handle ignorance and a lack of self-reflection. Taiga puts everyone before her. She does what she can do in order to see the people in her life that she cares for happy and well. Well, Ryuji puts himself before others, being the one to wear his emotions on his sleeves and express his own opinions around others, but also using it in a way that he feels would benefit the people around him. One is selfless for a selfish reason, and the other is selfish for a selfless reason. As for the others alongside him, Kitamura is a diligent student who likes to help wherever he can, 
Kushieta is a cheerful girl who takes on a number of responsibilities and loves to see Taiga happy. And Ami Kawashima, who appears later on, is a celebrity who puts on an act of likable student and calls out what she detests, trying to get others to be honest. And if it were simply just that, there wouldn't be much to say. But what the show does is deconstruct characters' mentalities and put their own shortcomings in front of their own faces. The reality of it is, every single one of those characters I mentioned, they're all idiots. And honestly, I love that. I can imagine right now you're probably thinking what do I mean by that, because usually someone like me would enjoy having characters that are written to be smart and developing. Here's the thing. Having your cast of characters be idiots isn't a bad thing. Having your cast of characters be idiots that never learn or grow is. Torador's casts are full of idiots, but they're all capable of growing and learning. Basically, they treat being a teenager like it pretty much is. Being a child preparing to go into a world you're not ready for. But to go down the list of events, most of it in the first half is at least mainly just slice of life stuff, going to the pool, vacation, school, etc. But in the midst, there's actually some story that opens up to new interactions. Take Kawashima's story. Initially, she showed up being played off like a two-faced bitch, really. But as time went on, her story shows more than that. She likes messing with people, but she hates being messed with. She's more than willing to call out something she hates, but sometimes it's more centered on her own faults. Like having a stalker follow her, making her believe she's in danger, only to realize that the guy wasn't really all that dangerous, and it aggravated her that she let herself believe she was being threatened. As time goes on, she at first has this sort of rivalry with Aisaka, but in time it became this connection where Kawashima feels like if Aisaka doesn't have anyone with her, no one's actually going to empathize. With Takasu, she sorta of teases romantic feelings around him, at first sorta of to get under Taika's skin, but as time goes on, you can tell she does like him, but also she's fully aware of what's happening, and even alludes to Takasu potentially hurting someone, believing his behavior is destructive. Ami to many others comes off as incredibly mature, knows everything and so on, mainly due to her success and that her world is ultimately different from the others. But at the same time, it's evident that she is still somewhat childish. Even believes it herself. A closer comparison I can make is Holden Caulfield from Catcher in the Rye. Someone who plays themselves off as a mature, deep, fully realized individual, when in reality, they're just a spoiled brat. Although in that, it came off more as manipulative and deceptive for the reader, whereas with Kamashita, that facade and real-world image are used as both a point of her character and a way to help develop her. With Kitamura, in terms of being a child, he does take the cake. As he simply starts off as a good friend to Takasu, later on how he acts becomes very evident he's immature and even impulsive at times. Instead of confronting a problem head on, he'd rather distract from it in any way. He later learns that his crush is leaving school and his response is to act like a giant baby and then confess his feelings right then and there in the hopes that she'd return them. However, he also tends to be self-reflective at times and even play devil's advocate to some rather stupid ideas. He's smart and open-minded, but also the opposite in some ways. Kushieta, well, she plays off the cheerful girl that has all these different jobs and is incredibly helpful. Her story shows that she also has a tendency to believe every mistake she makes is one that she and she alone has to correct. However, she also tends to fly off the handle and get pissed. An example of someone who seems responsible in thinking in the long run, but also has a fair deal of self-deprecation at times and gets fed up when she doesn't like something. And then there's the two main leads, Taiga and Ryuji. Ryuji at times seemed like a smart, dependable young man who wears his thoughts and emotions on his sleeves, but also at times feels sorry for himself and beats himself up over something well out of his hands, or sometimes something he inadvertently is responsible for. Takazu can take care of himself, but he also tends to get down on himself at the same time. As for Taiga, she's emotional, headstrong, klutzy, and at times genuinely selfless, wanting to have the people in her life be happy. She's a good kid who wants to bring happiness at times, but usually at the cost of her own. She plays the role of matchmaker and tends to try and make other people happy, but never works on herself. Aisaka's a good kid with a heart of gold that would rather give that gold to someone who needs it. And while that might be good for them, how could she continue on if she's left without a heart to give anymore? One of the big moments in the series is Taiga's father coming back into her life, which Ryuji believes he's actually trying to change for her sake, and tries to get her to see the same thing. Even though both Aisaka and even Kushieda think that this isn't right. 
Now, Kushieta knows what will happen to her if she doesn't wake up, but never bothers to tell Takasu. And when it came to her time on stage, her own father, someone who promised to show up to see her perform, couldn't even bother to see her face to face to tell her he couldn't make it, let alone call her. Instead, Takasu had to hear it in her place and the responsibility was put on him. Then it finally clicks. Ryuji never had a dad. All he knew was he died long ago and that the face that made him an outcast he got from him and in his own ways, he projected himself onto Taiga, believing that it was what she needed when in actuality, it was what he needed. Then all of a sudden, Taiga shows up on stage with a pre-written announcement for her father to show up. All alone, on stage, not a single word. And then... This one moment, barely any dialogue from either characters. In this moment, for me at least, is where the show began to turn into something more. There were moments and hints prior to this of the characters being complex, but this moment alone, for me, made me realize that this show was more than just a typical romance series. It was more than just a will they won't they. It was a group of teens living in a world with expectations they couldn't meet as well as people they couldn't stand. What I love too is that even after this moment, even after she makes a stand against her dad and amazes the crowd with her talents, this doesn't mean anything. It's hollow. She acts like she was able to pull herself back together, and yet Takasu in the crowd understands that in this moment, that she's still alone. Nothing has changed. Both him and Kushieta afterwards forget about everything beforehand, even Takasu forgets about his crush with her, all to play their part to show Isaka that she isn't alone. Not anymore. And that's where I feel the story has its footing. These characters are more than just pieces on a board for a game of romance. They both act and feel like genuine teenagers. Even other characters like Sumire Kano, for the short amount of time they get, highlight how being mature and an adult, even knowing you're stepping into that world soon, is mainly a facade to hide away how you really feel, what you really want. And at times, it takes being immature and even being out of control as a teenager to show that honestly. Near the end of the show, the teacher says something profound to the class about life and how there won't always be answers you look for or satisfied with. And instead, letting it sink in, they instead get on their phones and look for those answers. That's the tone of the show through and through. It's not all about love triangles or heartbreak, or will they won't they are preparing for adulthood. It's about the ups and downs of adolescence. The poor decisions, the image you show to the world, the act of hiding everything because you think it's what others want, when in actuality, it's all in your head. There's no right answer to being an adult the show highlights. Everyone just goes through it similarly and differently. Even the adults highlight how growing older just means that there's nothing else to it. But before I get ahead of myself, let's talk about the main leads, Taiga and Ryuji. Why doesn't anyone seem to understand us? Seriously, we're nothing but a couple of nervous wrecks all the time. So why can't people see that? Like I mentioned from the beginning, both are outcasts, one only looking like a thug, the other acting like one. Both of them form this friendship where they both go to lengths to show how much they mean to one another. Aisaka breaking down after being the only one who knew who was drowning, Ryuji running in a school event to be by her side when she's alone, all the while, people somewhat interpreting it as them being in love but just not seeing it. It's not until Christmas where you can really start to see that actually being the case though with Ryuji in a bear suit spending time with her while she's alone on Christmas. And Taiga realizes that, without him in his life, she'll be where she was before he showed up that night. Alone. The two of them have been hanging out in and out of school for a while now, and pretty much got used to helping one another out. The thought of him leaving to be with her best friend and ending up alone in her apartment, deep down is the last thing she ever wants. Even if she figures it's best for them. There's a comment Ryuji makes about Taiga early on how she kinda looks like a doll, and honestly, 
I think this is where it really hits, not just for the audience, but for herself. Being a doll, essentially only being useful for someone else, only being needed for someone else, but then left alone when she's not needed or useful anymore. Kushida comes across the sight of her best friend crying and breaking down for the person that she needs most in her life gone, and decides to reject Ryuji, figuring that in the end, what she needs most is him. Because at the end of the day, she knows Taiga first and foremost deserves a happy life. And while it's hard to say that they wouldn't work well together, Kushida knows what she personally wants conflicts with that reality. Quick enough, this all comes into play during their ski trip. At this point, a lot of what the main cast of friends are doing with and going through, you can see being reflected on others around him. The bickering, the fighting, the unrequited love, the obliviousness, it's all there. Kawashima presses Kushida on the matter, only getting one side of the story however, but pretty much unaware of what Kushida saw. Kawashima was fishing for an honest answer, but it wasn't something Kushida wanted to be honest about. Eventually it comes to a point where the two of them end up fighting, leading to Taiga going off and getting lost, all the while a snowstorm heads towards everyone. In their attempts to find her, Ryuji stumbles across her, unconscious and covered in blood, assuming she's being carried back by Kitamura, who she confesses into a daze that she loves Ryuji. Now this part is interesting, because throughout the years, I had heard absolutely nothing about the manga, or even the light novel. And initially, I was under the impression that the series was only adapting the manga, and I was going to talk about how the ending feels so in line with how the series should have ended as opposed to the source material, until I did a bit of research to find out that the anime was adapting the light novel, and the ends are pretty much the same. But with that said, I do want to talk about the manga. Interestingly enough, where both the anime and light novel go, the manga stops short of the moment around Valentine's Day, which is essentially where the endgame starts. The manga's run is a little more disorganized in the beginning, and some of the more uncomfortable moments feel more watered down and don't hit as well personally. The end to it all, again, stopping short of the actual endgame, makes it feel so... incomplete. There's a lack of actual conclusion here that feels less like an end and more like the series couldn't be serialized anymore. And honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if that was actually the case. Now as for the anime, this is, without a doubt, the most fitting endgame to a series such as this. Everything feels like what has been this series' biggest flaw with these characters is finally coming to a close and everyone feels like they're showing everything on the table. Kushida most notably has taken everything that had happened prior to heart, even resolving herself in knowing what she needs to do. Kawakami has come to terms with her own feelings realizing what she wants, but also understanding that it's really all for naught. Kitamura pretty much had everything about him resolved prior, but he does play his part in the story still, just not in the same way as both Minori and Ami. As for Tiger and Ryuji, both of them, well, they've changed, but also haven't. Taiga feels more distant to Ryuji now, while also trying to become close to him as well, while Ryuji feels like he's figured out the right course of action to take, making Taiga believe she was saved by Kitamura, neglecting to mention anything about what she had unconsciously said, and asking him to play along. But also in many ways, both of these characters just feel lost and unsure. Without talking about it, both of them are trying to return to how things used to be, and at this point, it's all come to a close. Upon giving everyone chocolates, Takasu realizes he made a mistake. He never told Minori the reason why she believes Kitamura saved her. And upon pressing Taiga on it, both her and Ryuji don't seem to fess up to anything. Kujia just becomes fed up, sick and tired of watching both of them as is. Watching Ryuji lie and fabricate what had happened and watching Taiga hold back what she actually remembers about that day. And at this point, it's evident what the two of them mean to each other. From the get-go, both Taiga and Ryuji have been spending their school year together. Albeit, it was around plotting and scheming, but more and more, you can tell that the both of them at some point went from neighbors to friends to being close to one another. Even if what Takasu was doing was, to him, a means to make her happy, it's evident that he does care for her to the point of doing something as stupid like showing up to her house in a bear costume as Santa. And as for Taiga... More and more, her crush on Kitamura slowly tears down to the point where she gets the chance to be with him for a considerable amount of time and realizes how wrong it is. But with Ryuji, 
she continuously gets supported by him over and over to the point where she even feels like he's the only one who's there for her when she needs it most. Not her crush Kitamura, not a best friend Minori, not even her rival and acquaintance Kushida. Ryuji, her next door neighbor, her accomplice in romance, and the person who's always been there thick and thin for her. And the thought of losing him brings her to tears. She knows her feelings through and through, but still wants to push it down to make him happy. Both of them are so busy trying to make each other happy by making everyone else happy, but are so blind to see that everyone else is capable of making themselves happy. So what about them? What about Ryuji and Taiga? If everyone else is happy on their own, more or less, who is there to make them happy? The voice acting in this show, especially near the end, is so goddamn unbelievably perfect. Eric Kimmerer as Ryuji plays off the kind kid with a menacing appearance while also balancing confusion, irritation, shock, depression, and even flustered all together really well. Cassandra Lee Morris as Taiga is also solid, with her delinquent and klutzy mannerisms alongside her smug, kind, and closed-hearted tendencies being fully addressed. Christine Marie Cabanos as Minori sell the extroverted high energy while also being able to play off her more down-to-earth attitude, self-deprecating moments, and full-on fury and even anguish to a goddamn T. Erica Harlatcher's Ami plays off the lovable celebrity flawlessly while also being able to play off the more childish, irritated, and tired sides extremely well. And Johnny on Bosch as Yusaku Kitamura plays the best friend role flawlessly, from his more comical sides, supportive mannerisms, and childish tendencies on full-on display being portrayed perfectly. And it's not just them. Karen Strassman, Brian Beacock, Mela Lee, Max Middleman, Carrie Karanen, Wendy Lee, Kirk Thornton, Julianne Taylor, and so many others in the show. The English dub is honestly pretty damn perfect and every actor and actress plays their part to a T. And finally, to get back on track, the last few episodes carry something that has been neglected and needed for quite some time. These characters finally being open and honest. Upon chasing down Taiga after getting an intervention from Minori, she fully admits that she was in love with Ryuji, but she knows full well just how much he means to her. So instead, Minori believes the best option more than anything is to have them end up together making her best friend not have to feel like she's alone anymore, and making her come out and finally say what she really wants. She apologizes to Ryuji, knowing pretty much he's had a crush on her about not being able to return his feelings, but he in turn fully admits he does have a thing for Taiga, and upon her goodbye, she finds some form of closure by getting an indirect kiss. Quick enough, both him and Taiga reunite at the cake shop, mainly because he figured she wouldn't brush off work even after all this, and they decide afterwards to finally come clean and be honest with one another. Until... How dare you lie to me! What do you think you're doing here? Get off of me! Both their moms find them after work and confront them. Taiga letting out that she came back because her mom's with an hour man and is pregnant. And Ryuji being honest with his mom about how she's forcing the life she never had onto him. Soon after running from the both of them, both Taiga and Ryuji talk about it all. Taiga explaining everything that had happened, and Ryuji becoming self-deprecative and even thinking that it would have been better if he wasn't even born, with Taiga scolding him. So Ryuji upon all of this, has the bright idea to run away with her, at least until he turns 18, saying that by then, they'll be able to get married. With this moment being cut short due to their mom searching for them. Soon after hiding out at Kawashima's place, she confronts Ryuji on his feelings for her, asking him to just be honest. The look she gives him honestly is different than before. In the past, she's either had this look of disdain for him or even exhaustion. But here, maybe not all in words, but she's pretty much done. While she might have had a bit of a crush on him in the past, here, all she wants from him for once in his life is to be honest about his feelings. To which, he fully admits he's in love with Taiga. And after convening with Minori and Kitamura, they come clean with their plan to run away and get married. What I like here is how genuine this conversation feels. While Kitamura at first sort of humors the idea, 
Kawakami thinks it is, and rightfully so, a fucking stupid idea. Not to mention that once they actually do go through with this, there's most likely no going back, especially if the police get involved. But Taiga, for the first real time in her life, openly talks about what she really wants to her friends. And even though, by all accounts, all three of them think Taiga and Ryuji are making the wrong call and everyone pretty much acknowledges this, they let it happen. But not without some help, of course, with Minori giving them her savings, Kuchieta giving them the key to her beach house, and Kitamura giving them rice vouchers. The worst thing you can do in a situation like this for a story is write your characters to be flawless or unquestionable. Not only calling attention to how flawed an idea like this is, but also having the characters acknowledge that it is a terrible idea, but still go along with it because deep down, their hearts are in the right place. Just not the particular circumstances are letting it be as is, makes it feel genuine. Because that's kind of what being a teenager can end up as. Being in a bad situation, wanting a better out, just going about in the most moronic ways possible. And hell, their plan doesn't even work. Instead, Yasuko leaves Ryuji with the opportunity to be with his grandparents while she, well, pretty much had the same idea as him to run away. The two of them head out, eventually tricking Yasuko to come find Ryuji and lead her back to her parents. She fully admits to him that his dad was pretty much a scumbag as he figured. He found a new girl and ran off, and Yasuko was pregnant with everyone telling her to abort the kid. But she didn't. What I like about Yasuko is the subversion of the parental role most people, especially when you're younger, expected to be as. Yasuko, by all accounts, is a terrible parent. Ryuji was more of a parental figure than she was. She's a good mom, just not a good parent. In a number of ways, she's no different than the ensemble of teenagers in the story. An idiot that just never grew out of being a child in a number of ways. Not unlike Taiga's mom, pissed that she ran away and eventually even starts thinking she hates her and runs off like she threw a temper tantrum. Which is kind of the truth about adulthood. Beyond the money, the trinkets, the titles, the places, we're just children who got older. No one really grows up, and nobody really leaves behind who they used to be. We change, we adapt, and we learn, but at the end of the day, we're still us. Which is pretty much the whole moral of the story. No matter how old you get, no matter the circumstances, no matter the situations, no matter the time, we're all still children. But what's wrong with that? Take away everything materialistic you have as an adult. Everything to your name, really. And what do you have left? Some people have friends they hang out with and talk about shit that, by all accounts, doesn't fucking matter. But goddammit, do you enjoy doing it? Some people just want to feel like they're special. Some people want to escape reality and play pretend. Some people only care about themselves. Some people only care about others and neglect themselves. Some people hide behind a facade. Some people are brutally honest. Some people say everything on in their minds, and some people need to be put through the ringer to say anything. Some people are blind and deaf to matters, and others see and hear everything that's really going on. Some people need distractions to continue living, and some people don't want to be distracted by what's going on. Some people see the world in rose-colored glasses. Some people see it as a barren wasteland. Some people act like they know everything, and some act like they know nothing. And some are just living. Living their lives, good and bad, easy and hard. But at the end of the day, all of that and more. All of it really is no different than how we were as kids. The truth about growing up is both understanding and acknowledging that we're all just children that got older. And it's one thing for me to say it, but it's a whole nother matter for you to actually experience it and come into it in time. What I'm trying to get at is this. Live your life. At the end of the day, we're all human. We're all the same. Different, yet the same. Don't let others' opinions on who to love, what to do in life, or what to enjoy control you to your wit's end. But also know better. Don't let others shape who you are, but also know better. Torador's focus is around a cast of not just teens, but adults that are all, without a doubt, idiots. And that's the point of it all. We're all fucking idiots. And for a majority of us out there, it's fine. Help, sometimes being an idiot and not being in someone's life leaves them better off than if you were in their life. I don't know how to end this, so I'll just repeat what I've said in the beginning. 15 years later now, the one series I believe is one of the best romance series around young love is, and continues to be, 
Toradora. <music>